wellnesscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. You're listening to A Quirky Journey, the healthy family podcast with your hosts, Joe Witten and Fuad Kassab. Welcome to A Quirky Journey. I'm your host, Joe Witten, and with me I have Fuad Kassab, my crazy, annoying, amazing friend. Hi, Fuad. Oh, hi, Joe. How's it going? <laughs> Good. Um, now, we'll move on to the show's guest. Mm-hmm. Damien Christoph is a chiropractor and naturopath, and he is one of the founders of the Wellness Couch. Um, amazing guy. Mm. Um, we, I've been listening to uh, his podcast uh, for years. Uh, when I started on this health journey, he, he was probably um, the only Australian podcast I was listening to. Wow. That was yeah. So um, was, he, was he on his own, or you mean with the wellness guys? With, with the wellness guys. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So the wellness guys podcast. So um, th- it was fantastic to see that there was a movement here that's going on, and it's amazing to see where they've taken it. Like the wellness mm. couch uh, had the wellness summit, which uh, last year had a thousand people come in over a two day period, and it was a massive, massive festival of wellness and health, and we loved it. We we mm, spoke there. So much fun. And. Uh, Damien is one of those people that um, I really love listening to yeah. his opinions, his ideas about health. He comes at it from a very different perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and um, Joe, you've had a, a long-standing relationship with Damien mm-hmm. as well. Yep. Um, so they, the wellness guys got me on their podcast, goodness, must be almost four years ago. And... Um, it's so funny, actually, the way this podcast started. Um, Brett Hill um, sent me a message about the podcast, and I thought I read it wrong. I must have been in a rush, as usual. And I thought he asked me, "Did I? What about a podcast for me, like to start one?" But he'd been asking something about their podcast and having me on. And and I said, "Oh." I hadn't really thought about it. But, yeah, that's a good idea. I'd love to do a podcast. And he wrote back and said, oh, that wasn't what I was asking, but that's a great idea. Yes, let's do it. You do a podcast. <laughs> and so that's oh, how this wow. one started from. It was oh, a, a, a mistake. Good mistake. Yeah. <laughs> it was a good mistake. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they interviewed me and then um, they got me down to uh, the Wellness Summit in 2014. And um, was that the first one I went to? I think it was. Um, but I felt like I already knew them all by then because we'd done a fair few podcasts on the different um, podcasts on the wellness couch by then. So, yeah, they, um, and I just love the way that Damien um, comes across and the way he explains things. He's so – he's very humble and um, gentle in the way he speaks, but he has so much knowledge and he just shares it in a beautiful way, I find, and he's very – easy to listen to yes he's yeah. he's intelligent yeah which is you know not something that can be said about everyone within you know the, the health sphere <laughs> um and he's very clear about his message yeah which i really like i like clarity in message i like simplicity and clarity because the more you um make things difficult to understand you're going to lose people's attention yeah. and they won't be able to make the changes so we we get an opportunity to um affect people in a very short period of time. So either you get them or you don't. And uh, clarity is really, really important. So if, you, if you're not clear, then you're losing an opportunity of saving someone's life potentially, you know, in the long term. Now we're not, you know, this is, this is how we look at it. We look at it as, as in this is definitely a life-changing message that we have and we need to be able to articulate it correctly. And he does a great job yeah. with that as well. So on today's podcast, we talk about health and healing and uh, what that really is. We talk about chiropractics and natu- naturopathy and a lot of things, but also we get on to topic which a lot of people have been asking about and talking about since I came back from um, my overseas trip, my Facebook feed and uh, my email. Uh, has I've received a lot of messages about the changing the changes that are happening regarding uh, private health care and, and the insurance uh, aspect for natural health care. So um, um, we get into this topic in particular and we get a really interesting perspective from Damien about this, which is not your standard, 
oh, uh, you know, the government's out to get us mm. and we, um, you know, they're trying to destroy natural health care. No, it's a very different perspective, which I really, really enjoyed uh, hearing. Mm. It's a very balanced perspective and it puts the onus back on us to take action and tell you how to do that mm. as well with some links in the show notes on how to take action to make things better yeah. for this situation. A great big welcome to our good friend, Damien. Hi, Damien. Hey, Joe. Hey, Fuad. Thanks for having hey, me. So good to oh, It's a pleasure. It's, it's long voice. overdue for us. Yeah, hey. I haven't caught up for ages because we had no wellness summit actually, this year. <laughs> I know. Well, I was actually, I actually had resigned the, to the idea that maybe I'd never be invited to be on your podcast. <laughs> Oh, like, you should have invited thought, well, yourself. We would have you know, said, sure. <laughs> I'm actually obviously not one of the cool kids. I know. We just uh, think I wasn't of you as, on the weekend. No, you we just think of you as too cool, cool for us. Kids. See, you're just like so in demand. <laughs> not, at, not at all. <laughs> That's a nice way to flip it around, Joe. Well done. <laughs> That was clever. Uh, oh, yeah, no, it looks so it great. It is that way, Demo. Like, I, I actually so used to listen to you years ago on yeah. uh, the Wellness Cloud and, you know, I, when I was still a software engineer. So whenever I approach you, like, you know, there's a bit of trembling and anxiety when I talk to you. you know? <laughs> that's so, hilarious. You know, like, yeah, that's, well, that's I remember that when I was first <laughs> invited to speak at the Wellness Summit, that was in 2014, and I told Fuad, I said, oh, I've been invited to speak at this, and I hadn't really heard of you guys, so I wasn't into podcasts back then and for what's like oh yep. yeah yeah i listen to them and i'm like oh okay <laughs> so there you go <laughs> there you go there you go hey that was my oh, introduction it's, it's to podcasts with you guys ah oh, here we are right i know it's just here we so are far. look at us <laughs> mm. oh, taking on the world trying to help out people and try to help educate people which is a really important thing you know yes. obviously there's lots of education out there and people can do a google search on pretty much anything these days but to get real people talking about real stuff and real events i think is um is is very powerful and you so know, it's nice that you guys are doing what you're doing i think it's excellent it's funny you should say that i had a comment on facebook um, a couple of days ago from a guy who obviously doesn't know us at all and he said why mm. do you call your book life-changing food he said I can do a Google search on anything and find out what I want to know. Why is your book so special and why do you think you've got the answers and blah, blah, blah. And I, I just wrote back and sent him links to a couple of different of our podcasts um, with Fuad's story and Isaac's story and I said, have a listen to these. This is why we think, you know, the, that's this is why we called our book Life Changing Food. Um, but, yeah, he thought, you know, that was a bit presumptuous, I guess. But, you know, it has changed our lives. It's been amazing. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Well, food has and the understanding of what food does and obviously you're using GAPS and going so well into GAPS. But yeah. uh, even in the early days, Joe, when it was all just quirky mm. um, and, um, and and you were you know, using Thermix and, yeah. and that was kind of the basis for, for which you created your profile, yeah. um, that was groundbreaking back then because who knew you could actually have allergy-free or allergy-friendly yeah. or you yeah. know, these sorts of foods and so easily and so beautifully with your Thermomix recipes and your recipe books, all that sort of thing. It was, um, it was re I think that's the reason why um, – I think you're one of the reasons why people actually feel comfortable doing amazing things and different things with food and experimenting, Joe. Oh, so it's, you, you created the revolution. <laughs> and they, whenever I go somewhere with Joe, um, there's someone like sort of sitting on the sides and uh, just looking at Joe and I see them in the corner of my eye. <laughs> I know like what's going to happen. And they're like, they'll be sort of taking a step forward, taking a step back and they'll be like, I'm like all right, it's going to be like at least one minute before that person builds up the courage and goes up to Joe. And then, and then they go up to Joe like, Joe, you don't know me, but oh my God, I've been following you from you saved you my too. life. <laughs> yeah. You'll never know what you've done. I can't thank you enough. <laughs> it's so sweet. And, yeah, and, and you know, they, they say that Joe's entered their home and they feel like they're part, she's part of their family and she's <laughs> taught them how to eat. And, you know, what a powerful thing to, to actually teach a, a family. Aww. So, and you now, know, she's been doing this for so long. And now we get the comments of, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I'm seeing both of you in the flesh because I hear you in my earphones every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's taking nice. it to the streets. Yeah. Really great, really great. Now, well done, you guys. You're Thank doing you. an amazing job. It's really fabulous. Um, Damon, um, Joe and I were talking about bringing you on the show because um, we feel like um, your specific background and um, – I'll ask you to, to talk about that in a little bit, but you have a very interesting background in your education and also 
the way you articulate things and your clinical experience, you bring a lot of clarity to this topic. You're not uh, just a health practitioner who's gone to university and learned what they need to learn and then they've kept going with their life and, you know, they're outdated exactly. with the science. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're, you're all in. And mm. um, the clarity that you bring to your topic and your perspective uh, is something that we want to bring to the people who are on this health journey because we feel that if pe people aren't standing on a solid foundation, they're going to be swaying with a lot of popular opinion or popular science that's going to flip its mind every, you know, f you know, couple of hours sometimes mm. so, yeah that's right um you know can you please uh, give us a little bit of background about yourself and how how you got started and and your variety of education that you have and where you're at with your practice at the moment yeah oh, thanks for yeah look I, I my background is quite it's an unusual one because um you know quite often people find their way into health because they're unwell and that was obviously the, the same reason why i found my way into health but i originally wanted to be an account actually i wanted to be a vet that's oh. really what i wanted to be yeah. yeah i wanted to be a vet yeah and i had a cat and her name was puss puss and uh <laughs> and she was just this beautiful little Original. you know tabby thing <laughs> yeah i know right <laughs> <laughs> my first cat was uh satchmo and uh and so she was this beautiful black cat and we named her after louis armstrong yeah, yeah. and um and my next door neighbor threw her against a fence and oh. she died oh, and that's uh awful. it was the most terrible thing and so wow. i was hesitant to get a cat and i felt you know, like I want to be able to, you know, help animals out. And so I had budgies and I had um, cats and I had, you know, he, and anyway, so my cat got hit by a car um, when she was about 12 years old and I went to the vet and she meowed and I fainted. <laughs> so I realized oh. that I probably shouldn't be a vet anymore, right? So I thought, well, I won't be a vet. Um, I'll, uh, I'll I did nearly the same thing and I was <laughs> really. <laughs> I was going to be a vet. It, you know. <laughs> Sometimes it's just the smallest little things that change your direction. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I wasn't very disciplined at school. I got accepted into a university that kind of had to take me. And um, and I went to this university and studied accounting. Did two and a half years of first year accounting and lived a really poor um, student existence. I lived off my OS study. Um, most of my OS study money went to drinking beer. Oh. Um, and there were $2 pots in those days. And I got $134 a fortnight. So I, uh, I wasted a lot of money. I think my rent was $25 a week. So it wasn't, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't bad, but I just didn't eat very well. And um, eventually I got unwell and mum said, Damien, you go see my naturopath. And so I went and saw this naturopath and he helped me get better. And and I was obviously really struggling at accounting and um, and I got better doing this naturopathy thing and I was quite fascinated by it and I thought, well, surely everyone's going to want to do what I've just done because it works. Um, I'll go study to be a naturopath, not realizing that it was fringe or yeah. um, contentious or anything like that. I actually didn't really know what a naturopath did. I actually had someone come up to me and say, oh, you were studying to be a naturopath. I said, yeah, she is. Oh, my friend started to be a homeopath. How cool is that? I go, yeah, that's really cool. She goes, they're pretty much the same. I said, no, nah, no, nah, they're totally different, you know. And I didn't even know that homeopathy and naturopathy would work together. And then, you know, I think maybe a year later I was studying homeopathy. And so I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, anyway, got through that, graduated with honours in herbal medicine and um, – and thought this is kind of a cool way to help people out yeah. and went and practiced in a in a valley called the Latrobe Valley in Victoria, a very polluted environment, um, lots of very, very sick people. And um, and I learned a lot about poor health and um, and the way in which people were kind of mismanaged. And but you know, not because of, of the doctors, but because of the system. The system was poor. The doctors really wanted to see people get well, but the system was just set up for failure and um you know, when you go direct to consumer drug advertising and people expecting that um, that all of their symptoms can be cured just by taking a pill and mm. that the illness will disappear if they, you know, take a drug, um, that system's flawed. So I, I became a little bit disenchanted pretty quickly and I realized that the healthiest people that I saw saw a chiropractor and I thought, well, maybe there's something in this chiropractic thing. And so I spoke to this guy, his name is Gary Coleman, and Gary said to me, yeah, Damien, health is all about the nervous system and the health of the nervous system is determined by the health of the spine. And so I went on to understand more about that and study to be a chiropractor. And so I blended two philosophies, those naturopathy and chiropractic philosophies to kind of understand how nature works and how the human body works. Because as much as we like to think that humans are better than nature, really, we are part of nature and, um, and, and we need to 
live in a symbiotic relationship with nature um, and with ourselves and our environment inside our bodies as important as the environment outside of our bodies. And and so I've, I've, you know, pretty much spent the last 20 years trying to communicate that message hmm. um, and learn more about that, that information and how uh, we can help humans get healthy without uh, pharmaceutical, drug-based or surgical intervention. Hmm. Wow. And um, has it worked? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Still feel like a when he goes to record. Uh, I'm, really, I'm trying so hard. It's one of those things, you know, like at the moment we're faced with some very interesting political times and uncertainty mm-hmm. in around natural health and, um, and you know, for, for what it's worth, some of, some of what's going on, you know, were warned about a long time ago and some of what's going on is, you know, quite a, a, a big reaction to – um, I, I suppose a smaller problem, um, but there's a bigger problem out there, and that is that more and more money gets put towards drugs and surgeries um, and experimental therapies that are very dangerous, mm-hmm. and not a lot of money gets directed towards um, relatively safe therapies with high uh, patient satisfaction um, and um, and high utilization. So it's um, it's a bit of a worry, and in Australia we've got a, a mentality of what's right or wrong or what's good or bad or what's um you know what's black or white it's the the challenge that we face in australia is that we we polarize people and our media does a really good job of polarizing people and our mm. politicians polarize people and and opinions then become very polar and and because of that there's no opportunity for a meaningful discussion and that means that you're either right or you're wrong and if you're wrong then you're outcast if yeah. you're right then you're part of a majority and and it means that we can only really move in one direction, and and that's a very narrow-minded um, view and scope. Mm. And it's very it's very worrying with where we are in health. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to get into that point um, further down the track. I don't want to talk about the scene in Australia and what's going on with the political um, uh, platform at the moment uh, right away. Um, I, I want to keep that sort of t- till the end because. I want to get your perspective on health, first of all, so that when we talk about what's going on in the political world, we can tie it back to, to your view as well. Um, just to lay that foundation. And sure, I, no. I think, um, I mean, part of the reason why, uh, Joe, and I wanted you to come on the show today is to talk in, uh, about the political aspects of what's going on. Because since I have come back from overseas, um, my Facebook feed has been just flooded with all these people saying, talking about natural health therapies being under danger and all that. And I'm getting email petitions. And I'm sure our listeners are very, very interested in that. But mm. I, I want to get your uh, your view and based on your clinical practice and all the history and education that you've done, maybe we can just start by defining your perspective of health. Like, wh- where are you at with that? Because I know it's an ever-changing definition. Yeah. You're ever-deepening your knowledge and your perspective with every every patient that you meet. Give us a, a little bit of your wisdom there, Damon. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. So um, I, I think it, it's taken a lot of uh, twists and turns. And um, there's different – I suppose there's different ways in which you can practice as a as a therapist or as a practitioner. And – and the model that's very common in Australia is that of what's called allopathy. Um, and allopathy is the uh, treatment of disease um, with the expectation that the way in which you treat the disease is from the outside in. And so the, the benefit um, or the therapy is applied to the body um, and then the body responds and heals from the outside in um, and then from uh, the gastrointestinal system up. And uh, so from below to above. And that in itself um, is, is what we would call a reductionistic mm. um, approach to health and healing in that there's something faulty in the body and it needs to be fixed um, or there's something deficient in the body and, uh, and the body is now faulty. And so that in itself means that the way in which we approach it is that the body, it doesn't have the intelligence to actually heal itself. It needs something or somebody from outside of the body to fix it. And for me, um, I practiced in that sort of model for a long time. I used um, herbs and vitamins and supplements and, um, and a lot of things to impact the way in which the body would heal. Now, I'm not saying that Part of that isn't true and correct because we do know that when you put the right food into the body, then it can heal itself. We do know that if there's deficiency in the, in the body, if you can top up from a nutrient perspective, you can 
um, get rid of those deficiencies or insufficiencies and the body can go about doing what it's meant to do. Mm -hmm. But really the control of all of that actually takes place in the nervous system. So essentially healing has to take place first in the brain and then it moves its way down through the spinal cord and then out to the organs. The organs can't heal themselves without instruction from the brain or the nervous system. So it's not mm. actually possible. It's not humanly possible. Um, the bacteria in the gastrointestinal system or what we call the microbiome, they can assist in the healing of the gut but left untended, um, the gastrointestinal system will become very, very permeable. And so the brain controls essentially the permeability of the gastrointestinal system based on the environment of the gut. And so the nervous system, again, controls all of that and uh, and so healing comes from above down and then what's also really important to understand is that yes we can put things into the body to assist the body to heal but really healing occurs from the inside out so if we've got um, a skin affliction for example it's not that the skin's faulty it's that there's something that's not right inside the body that needs attention and then the skin will heal over time um, but that's because the direction of healing is from above in, in other words, the brain, down through the spinal cord, inside, so in around the organs, to the outside, to the skin. And uh, and that's the priority of the body in terms of its healing. Mm. So it's way more important for the brain to keep the heart pumping than to fix a cut on the toe. Mm. Um, or it's way more important for the body to manage inflammation or autoimmunity in around the gastrointestinal system than to worry about um, a, stuck, a stuck or a sore joint from rheumatoid arthritis or eczema um, in the folds of your arm. So there's a, a level of hierarchy or importance and um, and it's good to get that direction right. And then moving from a reductionist or an allopathic viewpoint um, of where you want to throw things in because bits are broken, um, I believe that the body has an intelligence that allows it to heal uh, for as long as it's alive. So for as long as you are alive, your body can heal and it's important to respect that. So what is it that we need to have that heals the body? And that is obviously the right nutrition, the right mindset. You know, a dirty mindset is not going to actually help you heal. Um, the right environment, I think it's really important to, you know, be surrounded by people and things and an environment that allows the body to heal um, and live because the body always wants to live. Like it doesn't want to die. That's why it just keeps on going and going and going until one day it gives up um, because it's had enough or it can't do any more. Uh, the body's intention is to keep you alive. So you just got to provide that right environment for that to take place. And so, yes, food's important, but that's part of altering the environment inside the body. And then everything around you is your environment that helps you live. And and for me, having done 100 Not Out with Marcus over the last nearly six years, mm. um, it's become very evident to me that the environment that we need to um, – adjust the most is the environment that we have with our friends and our family mm. and, uh, and and that you know that is if we're wanting to live a long time some people don't want to live a long time they just want to live you know a good time some people want to live symptom free and if they happen to live a long time that's a bonus um, but for longevity it appears that you know to be healthy it really requires um, some habits and those habits revolve around community engagement and purpose um, and movement um, and then food and, and other bits and pieces kind of come into that, but um, there's other important things. That's good. Um, well, what's your view on, um, like when you we look at healing the individual, because this is something I think about a lot, and um, over the years I've been thinking about this idea of we treat a symptom or an illness and then something else pops up in a, in a person. Let's say like you treat their eczema and then later on like their kidneys fail or, you know, they have something with the depression or whatever it is. And then I try to extrapolate that out into the societal level. So I look at us dealing with individuals and healing individuals and we go, oh, well, the individual is sick, so let's heal that individual, which is sort of like a more holistic approach trying to, as you were saying, dealing with the human being as an individual, healing them from the inside out. But we're still in a system that's creating sick individuals. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's, it's like trying to address the, the big toe when the arm's falling off or something mm -hmm. like that. And this, this continues to happen for us. So where do you see... Um, your role as a practitioner or someone uh, who is a leader in the health world, what steps do you take to sort of raise awareness to the greater society and make change at a societal level so that this kind of environment that creates sickness isn't there? Uh, it's, that's a, such a, a great question, Fui. And But what's interesting is that um, the political component of that education is very skewed in a, in a direction that makes it very, very challenging for people to actually even conceive 
that that's possible. Yeah. It's difficult for people still to see that their hand is connected to their heart and that their little toe is connected to their brain. Like it's really mm-hmm. hard for people to see the interconnectedness of everything. Uh, and, and the reason is because we've the, our system is set up with specialists. And so you've got a heart specialist or a lung specialist or a immunologist or a um, epidemiologist or endocrinologist or cardiologist or whatever. So you've got all these you know, specialties that focus only on one thing. And the, the smarter and smarter these guys get, the less and less they know about everything else. Mm-hmm. So they, they focus so much on one thing. So you might, yes, be trying to fix up the skin and you've found a, a novel way to decrease inflammation on the skin to get rid of eczema. So you give a drug to actually manage that, but that has a downstream effect on the kidney function, for example, or a downstream effect on bacterial function, the gut, which obviously then makes things even far worse. Yes. Um, but that's, you know, looking at the some of the parts being better than the whole, uh, whereas most people would agree that the sum of the parts doesn't equal the whole. And it, it's we try to work out how do we make the body as, as healthy as we possibly can via altering the environment rather than actually just looking at the problem. Um, with with the, uh, the this worry that we have about sickness, um, when people are now trying to avoid to being sick, like healing is a natural mechanism in the body. Should we be scared of it or is it something that should take place? Should we become sick? Because you hear a lot about this kind of bragging thing in the natural health world where people say, I haven't been sick for eight years or something like that. Yeah. And um, I get sick, you know, every once in a while. I, I'm not uh, ashamed to say it. You know, my, <laughs> my health journey is, is an up and down kind of thing. What, what yeah. do you think of uh, illness and uh, what's your perspective on it? Is it something to be scared of? And what attitudes should we have about it? Again, oh, this is these are great questions. I, I don't know if you ask everybody these same questions, but these are no, excellent he's questions. Just, he's just amazing at winkling things out of people. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great question because I, it's, I'm very passionate about seeing people express health and uh, and the expression of health is essentially a, the signal that you're responding to what what's happening in your environment. So part of that is is actually having symptoms. So if mm-hmm. you're in an environment and everyone around you is you know breathing in a virus, and then they express some kind of symptomatology, if you don't have even the slightest sniffle, then you kind of got to wonder whether or not you're actually really protect it or not because you, mm. the the symptoms that you express are the expression of the body healing itself or protecting itself so are you actually well protected or are you not very well protected you know what's what's actually going on there are you um are you actually just getting flooded with viruses and bacteria that are kind of doing having their own way with you and you're not actually mounting an, an immune response so I, yeah. I find it fascinating that people um, can often say that I haven't been sick for years and years. Or oh, they you hear this: oh, this really fit guy, he was never sick. He was really fit, you know, as a cyclist. And then one day he's playing tennis and he died on the tennis court. He was, you know, forty-two years old. We kind of go, well, was he sick or was he really healthy? And mm. the reality is, is that if his heart didn't work properly, then there was something not right. Now, was he expressing symptoms? No. Um, was he showing signs of debilitation? No. But did he ever express any signs of health? And the reality was, well, he had energy, so we would presume that he was well, but maybe he wasn't that healthy. So um, I, I like to see that people get a cold. I think it's good. Um, yeah, I really I- like to see that sometimes people come down. They, they actually – get struck by something and have to cough it up a little bit. But you don't want it to last for too long. Yeah. I think the, the ability to have symptoms and then get over it yeah. is the, the signal that the body's strong. That's the difference I've seen in my health. Um, like I'll still get a cold now and then, but I'm over it so quickly compared to what used to happen. I'd always end up with a chest infection. Um, but I find it interesting where, you know, some people do have, um, they seem to have a suppressed immune system and, they, and they're like, oh, I'm so healthy, I never get sick and they eat rubbish and they don't live a great lifestyle and you think, how can that be? <laughs> so that's interesting. Uh, 100%. Yeah, it's, really, it's a really fascinating thing, isn't it? You see people you know, having junk food and, mm. um, and, and they don't express symptoms um, and yeah. it, does, it, does, um, it does strike me as you know, quite unusual but there's uh, really interesting you know, things to consider there. Um, you know, there's. I, I read of a study yesterday um, in terms of morbidity. People who get sick more often, you're more likely to have a a, a chronic disease like heart disease, 
um, or diabetes if you are of normal weight and mm. inactive than if you're obese and active. Wow. So if you're obese and active, you're less likely to have cardiovascular disease and diabetes than if you're of normal weight and inactive. And so there's, you know, really fascinating, you know, information that comes out of that because you, it, it's easy for us to think that all of our problems come back to what we put in our mouth. But mm. there's, there's a whole host of other things that actually are linked to it. And, of course, movement's part of that. Yeah. Um, Damien, you shared a story with me the other day about <laughs> your mate with, uh, with a child who was coughing. Uh, yes. Would you mind? Would you mind sharing that with our listeners, please? Oh, what was the story? Was it uh, the person who who was coughing and then got adjusted, or no, 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 the the one who thought that their daughter was uh, had whooping cough. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's right. One of my great mates, you know, and this is the this is the predicament that we're in in Australia at the moment. There's so much fear around it. Inter- oh, really interesting. Um, was a study that came out the other day from the UK. And they said that uh, maternal uh, vaccination with whooping cough um, offered um, good good um, protection for the for the baby, but that the um, blanket vaccination of visitors to see the baby once it was born against whooping cough offered no further benefit. And so I thought that was a really interesting thing. But the reason why I found that so interesting and the only reason why I bring that up, even though I'm not, um, I suppose, I'm I'm certainly not qualified to comment on that. I'm not, you know, saying anything that people should or shouldn't do anything in that regard. But the reason why I'm saying that is that there's so much fear around um, whooping cough, for example, in Mm. Australia, that even the slightest cough, people can think the worst. And so I, I know, Joe and Fuad, when you were little kids and even with your own children, you would have seen them have coughs and colds and gone, sure. you, you, have, you had a cough and a cold, you know, yeah. you've got a cough. So be it, you know. Um, but I had a mate of mine who's a very educated um, health professional and he called me the other day and said, you know, I'm concerned because my daughter's got a cough. And I said, okay, you know, is it a cough? He said, yeah, yeah, it's a cough. But cough to the extent that uh, the baby vomited. And I said, oh, okay, well, that's good, you know, better out than in, you know, get mm-hmm. the mucus out, and, um, and and that's a good thing. He goes, yeah, but what if it's whooping cough? <laughs> and I said, well, what if it is whooping cough? He said, well, you know, it's, it, it could be whooping cough and my baby might die. And uh, and so for me it was this massive, enormous uh, leap where this person had gone mm. from baby with a cough to the worst possible um, oh, yeah. outcome, which yeah. is death. And and that there is the fault of what we call health scare mm. um, as opposed to health care yes. and, uh, and people, you know, banging on about things that are the, the, the worst possible scenario. And, yeah. of course, you'd hate for it to be whooping cold. However, my understanding is that we're now um, six days on from that, that phone call and that cough is now gone. So it was definitely not whooping cough. Mm. It was just a normal response the body to get rid of something that was inside the body that wasn't meant to be inside the body and that was a cough and now it's resolved itself and here we are in a really good place but um, the fear around um, what a cough could be is much the same as the fear around what a rash might be Mm. or the fear around um, what another symptom could be is has been perpetuated by this pharmaceutical juggernaut that makes people think that the only thing that can fix them is something from the outside rather than the power that made the body healing the body Mm. So it's uh, it's given no credence to the amazingness of the body, the fact that two cells come together, a sperm and an egg come together, and then all of a sudden the human body comes out nine months later and it continues to grow. It does really, really well, and without intervention it can blossom and do amazing things. And the more intervention this body gets, the more things go wrong. Mm. It basically has got to leave it alone. Um, but there's this fear that the body can't do much, that it's weak and that it's fragile and it needs doctors yeah. and it needs surgery drugs um, but that's not the case mm. well, we, we worry a lot about our kids like uh, if yeah. our children have a fever we don't know what to do and there's no education around that like uh, most people immediately want to break the fever for the child and they start throwing baby panadol at them and um, trying to break it but from my perspective like i don't think of healing as an anomaly i mean the body uh, goes through the healing process because it expects to be injured it expects invaders so it's part of the balance in life to actually be sick and to heal can you talk to us a little bit about the body's capacity for healing and uh, where do we intervene and where do we sort of allow it to take uh, take, take shape 
Yeah, sure. Well, it's actually designed, the body's well designed to, you know, to fight off invaders and there's different parts of the immune system that allow that to happen and there's responses that we know of called the inflammatory response. And then based on what actually comes into the body or what actually happens to the body, the incredible um, wisdom of the body, which it never had to learn, there's no PDF download, no iTunes account or Google <laughs> Play account to yeah. learn from. Like, there's no books written by Fuad Kassab on how to heal your body. It's actually, it's just there, right? It's it's already programmed in. It's like the, it's the uh, operating system of every single human body is to heal itself. And so there's mechanisms set up to fight um, bacteria. There's mechanisms set up to fight inflammation or to uh, to fight uh, debris so a break for example or a, or a, a burst um, there's mechanisms set up to fight virus there's mechanisms set up in, in you know I suppose in every um, potential possible outcome that the body might experience for the body to fight that off so to speak I don't like to use the word fight because it's really just to, to fend it off and to protect it yeah um, we so turn everything into a war Damien don't yeah we? it's not a war it's really <laughs> yeah. not a war so it's just, we kind of think well we can go and drop nuclear bombs on um, <laughs> bacteria in the body yeah. uh, to get of, a, of something but of course there's there's significant collateral damage when you take antibiotics and, and those sorts of drugs so yeah. but our body's very skilled at managing these infections the beautiful thing about medicine is where it is today is that we've also got the ability to utilize interventions that can assist our body to do it you know, either quicker um, or potentially um, offer support where the body's failing. Um, but what we don't do these days is allow our body to get sick and to go through it. So you might get a fever, which is the body's normal innate response to fight off a virus or a significant bacterial infection, and then we go and suppress that fever. And by mm. suppressing it, you're actually then allowing the bacteria or the virus to take over and do more damage. And so the symptoms will last for longer, the illness will last for longer because the body's um, been disabled or now are not able to mount an appropriate response. The likelihood of, um, of a fever going out of control if it's gradually increased over time is, is very, very small. The possibility of the fever getting out of control if it goes up very, very quickly is high and so i think there needs to be some education around what is a fever like is a, a low grade fever that tends to get up slowly 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 to arrive at 39 or 40 or 41 degrees is that okay and, and in my opinion for most people and this is a medical advice by any stretch of imagination it's actually okay to get to that point at slowly but if you go from a normal temperature of say 36 37 degrees and all of a sudden half an hour or an hour later you're at 41 or 42 degrees there's something significant going on so that's mm -hmm. where you'd seek medical advice. but the fact that we've got these powerful drugs like paracetamol and aspirin and nurofen or um ibuprofen in our pantries these days means that we can we can actually um, be our own doctor with very, very limited um, information or knowledge um, about what the long effect of that actually is and, and the significant long-term side effects to taking these sort of, of pharmaceutical uh, interventions. Interesting. So I, I keep asking all the questions. I'm going to leave, leave the floor to you for a bit. So, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just time. enjoying listening. So <laughs> well, I think it's all just about perspective, isn't it? So it is. what I'd love is, you know, if we get to the end of this podcast and I've shared a perspective on health so that people kind yeah. of go, oh, yeah, right, wow, well, that's interesting. Uh, if we get to that point, then that's a really great – that would be great for me. I feel like we've won. Yeah. Um, well, because there's so much to teach, isn't there, really, at the end of the day? I guess, we, like, I don't want to reinvent the wheel, so I'm just going to go with your uh, – your perspective now when a customer or I would say customer when a, when a patient comes into your practice now are you a chiropractor first or a naturopath first or how do you look at them what are your tools to assess things mm. um, how, where, yeah, what where road do you, do you take is there, is there a road that you take that is you know uh, the That's one that good. you most follow or is each patient different how do you how do you is there a it? basic blueprint that you say okay now we start with this first or hmm. Mm. I, that's that's great. I think I I would now say that I would start with the nervous system first. So I would be a chiropractor first. Yeah. Um, but when people come to see me, I'm asking them what their goals are. So I've got a mate of mine coming to see me in a couple of days' time, and I know that he needs food first. Mm. So there's no point me trying to address um, nervous system dysfunction, subluxation of the spine, 
um, or anything like that at this point in time until he gets his diet under control because the cause of his problems in his body is the way in which he's fueled his body. So I'll get him to see the nutritionist that we've got working with us and she'll help him Mm -hmm. get all that right. Um, And then I'll I'll come in and be at point whether it needs extra support through nutrition because things are so bad um, that maybe I've got to give some supplementation mm. to assist in the healing um, or maybe we've got to use some herbs to kind of you know bring some things under control because that's a probably a, a safer approach than using pharmaceutical intervention if we if we get that opportunity then those things will have to take place but um, at some point it's going to be really really important to address the dysfunction that's occurred in his nervous system because of course the nervous system is what controls the health of everything so I will want to look at his nervous system at some point to help him with that. So, and he's a mate of mine. Now, there'll be some people that come in to my practice and they say, there's nothing wrong with me. And, and I go, well, that's, that's fantastic. That's exactly the right place to be. So let's assess everything in your lifestyle. And so I'll start with the nervous system because that's the easiest thing to get under control. Mm-hmm. And then we'll look at diet and then we'll look at nutrition and then we'll look at sleep and then we'll look at movement. So we'll look at all of those sorts of things. But then the key thing that I'll ask is what is your goal? Like, what is it that you're actually wanting to achieve with your health? Because most people come in with an expectation that something's going to happen. So wh- what is it that you're looking mm. for? You're looking to live a long time. You're looking to manage some kind of uh, disease process. You're looking to manage some kind of symptom. Do you want more energy? What's your driver um, of the reason that you're in Yeah, because there's got to be a reason that they came in. That's it. So um, I, you know, for uh, to answer your question, I have my chiropractic hat on um, most of the time. Um, because it, um, the philosophy of chiropractic underpins the way in which I look at the world. Um, and then my approach to helping people get well is a blend between chiropractic and naturopathy. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of philosophy, but I, I try to be as human as I possibly can. You know, I try to take my practitioner hat off. I'm certainly not a clinician. I don't wear a white coat or have a <laughs> stethoscope. And we don't call our practice a clinic because it's not clinical. It's actually a very warm environment that, mm. you know, allows people to uh, to come and feel safe, um, knowing that over a period of time we'll be working on everything that they want us to work on to help them be well. Not, so we're not just going to go, okay, these are all the problems. Let's get to work fixing them all. Um, we we will we'll step it out and go you know, bit by bit um, with the philosophy of health. Can I? I, I wish you were near me. I was like, go yeah. ahead, Joe. No, you, you say that first. <laughs> no, I was going to say, like, um, t- to your point, um, I've been through a crazy health journey. I, um, you've heard my story before, Damien. So um, what what I'm dealing with now is I've gotten over the weight issues and the skin issues and all that. But what, what remains with me is this kind of uh, chronic pain in my body, which like, for instance, I always feel my left shoulder is tugged up and I always feel like my uh, spine, it's always cracking and I always have to push it back in place. So, um, I'm, I'm living with this inability to move that I'm trying different things to, to address. And I know that regardless of how well my diet's going to be, this is something that needs to be addressed at the nervous nervous system level, at the muscle level, at the spine level. So, um, is there um, is uh, we're looking at things like osteopathy or chiropractics or um, massage and physiotherapy, and there's all these different or rolfing. There are all these different modalities that people can go for to address these things, and I personally find myself confused as to which one to take. And I'm just wondering, maybe. I know that, you know, like being a chiropractor, you're just going to probably uh, suggest chiropractics as mm-hmm. the, the one to go with. But how do people choose the best modality for them? Oh, that's such a great question, mate. And I think what's really important to understand is that we've all got different functions, different roles. Um, and I work very closely with a group of physios uh, literally just up the road. We've got osteopaths that uh, work next door to me. I've got another chiropractor two doors up. Um, there's exercise physiologists and Feldenkrais practitioners just mm-hmm. around the corner. Um, we've got a masseur, a massage group that's literally 200 meters from me that I refer to as well. And, and it's really important to kind of understand, I suppose, that um, to get the body well, there's going to be some degree of triage. You know, we're going to need to um, get the services of a number of different practitioners to assist the body to yeah. heal really well. And it comes back then to the, um, the scope of practice that each of the practitioners um, employs. So... Chiropractors and osteopaths study in the same room together. In fact, 
um, the chiropractic and osteopathy started within six months of each other. Andrew Taylor Still, who founded osteopathy, and Dee Dee Palmer, who started chiropractic, uh, basically um, they were friends. They they knew each other. They um, shared each other's insights to the body, um, and they started you know this thing, 1895 for chiropractic and 1894 for osteopathy. osteopathy but w- literally within six months of each other, and it was all based on a really loose uh, premise that. Um, you know, the osteopathy looked at cerebral spinal fluid flow and blood flow as being um, the, 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 I suppose, the master of health and uh, well-being in the body. And chiropractic looked at the nervous system, and so we we looked at the spinal cord and the brain um, as to the way in which we um, help help the body heal itself. And so. Um, osteopathy in the United States became part of mainstream medicine because of the blood and the cerebral spinal fluid component. And chiropractic remained independent to mainstream medicine because the nervous system and the brain were seen to be independent of the function of the body, um, whereas we believe that it was actually the controller of the body. And now we understand that the nervous system does control the whole of the body. And so the difference in the philosophy of the two techniques, even though we learn exactly the same stuff at university, uh, it directs the way in which we apply our techniques. Mm-hmm. So I enjoy osteopathy. There's some things in osteopathy that I really, really like. Um, however, chiropractors are trained to work on the nervous system, and so our whole focus is nervous system. So if I was looking at a blood flow issue or I was looking at a cerebral spinal fluid flow issue or maybe even a cranial issue with children, um, I'd likely refer to the osteopaths next door to me. If I was looking at a um, at a nervous system issue, then I'd be the best person to be working with that sort of thing. So, you know, pain comes from the nervous system. Is that coming from the nerves or is that a blood pooling issue? Is it a cerebral spinal fluid flow issue? Chiropractors can help people understand that and so can osteopaths. And so they're, they're similar. It's just, I suppose, what do you, um, what resonates with you in terms of the approach? In terms of physiotherapists, they're excellent at helping people uh, return to um, a pre injured state. Uh, and so they look for rehabilitation, look to rehabilitate um, an injured joint or an injured muscle. Um, to the point of where it was beforehand. So it's not necessarily a preventative model, mm-hmm. though you can use uh, physiotherapy for prevention. Um, really, that comes down to exercise physiology and personal mm-hmm. training is uh, is physiotherapy for prevention. But um, really, physiotherapy is all about the treatment of a break or of, of something that's no longer working. And that's the same as massage. Massage can be used to decrease stress and can be used to you know, improve um, the fibers of the muscles. But again, the nervous system controls and directs the speed of healing and the relaxation of the muscles. So mm-hmm. it's about coming back to the nervous system because that's the master controller. So I kind of see, and I know that you just said that, yes, I'm a chiropractor, I'm going to say you see a chiropractor. <laughs> what I do see is that if there's an injury, then you'd probably see a physio. If you've got some kind of um, blood pooling issue or a, a lymphatic issue or a, a cerebral spinal fluid issue, um, then you might go see your osteopath. Um But I've got a lot of people that I see in my practice that I manage the health of their spine and nervous system and they see an osteopath Mm. and they see a physio and they get regular massage and they get acupuncture. And so it's not that um, it's it's all or nothing or one or the other. Sometimes that triage approach of having multi-practitioners working to help the body heal um, is a really great thing to do. And so it's just understanding the different roles. Yeah, (laughs) it's just understanding the roles. And I know there's financial considerations for all of that because unless it's drugs and surgery the government doesn't fund it um it's you know we've it's a user pay system here in australia so it's just that and that's just the way that it is unfortunately but that's just you know people got a budget to work out work out what that's going to give them the most of their benefit but Mm. the nervous system controls it so i would say use a chiropractor and whatever else um is required to get your body right can i just talk to you about the nervous system and brain side of things um, we found chiropractic really helpful for Isaac when he was so bad with his anxiety. Can you just talk a little bit about working on anxiety with what you do? Because I think we get a lot of people that ask us about those kind of issues. How does it work? Yeah. Yeah. It's a really interesting thing because, you know, um, and and one of the, the most challenging things I think around Uh, the understanding of how chiropractic works is that there's such a little amount of research and chiropractic's kind of been bundled into the back pain, neck pain, headache kind of um, therapy 
Uh, and, and so as a result, the, the research has been directed in those sorts of um, environments. But chiropractic first started in 1895 with Didi Palmer talking to his um, work janitor and he couldn't hear him properly and he just bumped his head and he couldn't hear him. So it's essentially deaf is what they say. And he, Didi Palmer was a magnetic healer and he decided that he was going to for whatever reason, I don't know, you know, all of the ins and outs, I wasn't there, but he palpated the um, janitor's spine and found that there, he thought there was a bone out of place. And so he, he uses language like, I racked the bone back into place. And <laughs> Sounds he, painful. He's hearing, I oh know, right? He, and you don't know if he did that with a piece of 4B2 or what he did, but you don't know. <laughs> but he, uh, he got that bone back to where he felt was best and this guy's hearing was restored. Anyway, so as the story goes, DD then traveled around all of the US and, you know, with a horse and cart and sort of found the cure to deafness and, um, <laughs> and millions of people went and got adjusted and thought that their hearing was going to be restored. And, and not one other person had their hearing restored um, over the next, you know, 10 years or whatever it was. And so, but what happened was that people would find that their neck pain went or their back pain went or their concentration improved or their, um, their mood improved or their their digestive problems alleviated or their pelvic problems, you know, mm. were improved or whatever else happened. There was this big, long string. And in DD's books, he writes of all the different conditions that he ended up managing to help people with. Uh, and, and back in those days, they were looking for silver bullets to cure things. And they were always looking for ways in which they would um, be able to save people from being sick. And so chiropractic then became one of those therapies that would help people but because it was so successful at neck pain and back pain and headache it kind of meant that that's kind of where we went and they were really easy things to research in terms of the research around um, happiness or anxiety depression um, mood stabilization uh, behavior cognition etc etc because the research is really limited there we don't necessarily understand the mechanism by which that works however what we do understand is that when there's um, um, a, a reduced uh, amount of tension in the spinal cord, whether that be from exercise, stretching, or chiropractic, or any other modality, when there's reduced tension in the spinal cord, the body operates better. Mm. And and left to operate better, the body has the opportunity to heal itself better, if that makes sense. Okay. So it's that there's less attention in a particular area um, of need uh, and so then the body is then able to then go and just do what it needs to do, and that is yeah. heal. And so it's that whole contention that chiropractic fixes anxiety or fixes um, stress or whatever else. Yes, there's going to be mechanisms that explain that. Can we explain it yet? Probably not really, really well. But what we do and the way in which we describe that it actually happens um, is that we're removing um, interference to the nervous mm. system to allow the body to get to the end point of healing and mm. so it's not meant to be esoteric and it's not meant to sound quasi religious but what it's meant to what it's meant to indicate is that the body has a, a remarkable ability to heal and by removing interference to the ability to heal which is um, coming from the spine then it can actually heal itself and and so that's probably where Isaac mm. yeah. received the benefit rather than chiropractic treating anxiety or depression mm. it just really alleviated any extra tension or torsion in his spinal cord well it's very much like when um you you reduce like with what we did with the diet with gaps um when you 100%. take out the foods that are difficult to digest and the body's not working super hard trying to just digest food it can actually focus on the healing i guess it's the same kind of principle oh absolutely and there's a um there's a great saying by bj palmer um bj was um dd son and so bj was the guy where they they call the developer of chiropractic and so there was the inventor the developer and then bj son was the destroyer of chiropractic so we find that <laughs> nice. uh, but bj said the body needs nothing uh, i think the body yeah the body needs nothing to heal it just needs no interference yeah and uh, and so, in other words, exactly. if the, if left to its own devices and in a great environment where there's no deficiency or interference, then the mm. body can actually heal itself. Yeah. So, if the interference is coming from food, yep. it, you know, if it's coming from foods that you're allergic to or causing disruption yes. to the gut, right. um, then, of course, that's going to be a problem. You've got to remove all of that. That mm. in itself is what I would call a subluxation or a yeah. blockage to proper healing. Yep. Um, and if that's coming from the spine, then you address it. If it's coming from 
um, bed sheets because they've been, you know, washed in mm, um, chemicals yeah. that cause problems. Yeah. Or if there's toxins in the home, then those are the subluxations to the mm. body's ability to heal. So you remove any of those barriers to healing um, and, and then the body can heal itself. That's really good. I really like that picture of removing the roadblocks and so the body can do its work. Yeah. Nice, hey? That's, That's a philosophy. It only, <laughs> <laughs> what did it take us to get to that point? It took us 50 <laughs> something minutes to get to that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we should yeah. probably. Um, with it. They say, leave it alone. Leave it alone. Leave, it alone. <laughs> leave the body alone. Let it do its thing. And, I think uh, that's also it all uh, uh, part of the reason why fasting is so powerful yeah. as a healing modality, as well, is that you just give it a, give it a bit of a chance to get back it. on its feet. Take the pressure um, off. Yeah. Uh, Damon, with. Um, Here's a bit of a question for you that um, I've just moved to the Blue Mountains a few months ago and I've been looking for a local chiropractor Mm -hmm. and um, it was a couple of days ago I was driving around and um, I saw a chiropractor sign but in front of it the fence was all crooked. I'm like, I'm not going there. (laughs) (laughs) Chiropractors are going to have straight fences and straight signs. (laughs) So oh, it's posture, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, <laughs> one of the those things that um, like I know you need a little bit of commitment before you start seeing results with a the chiro. Sorry, with the chiro. Sometimes, you know, they say, well, the initial treatment's gonna be three times for uh, a week for the next six weeks, and then we'll start going down to you know two days a week and then once you know every fortnight or whatever it is and it's a long-term yeah. commitment and you kind of yeah. don't know how well you're progressing until the time's gone by and sometimes you could just be throwing money down you know the wrong practitioner like they just might not be good for you and you have no idea how to ascertain that because you're asked to be patient before results are be a patient are, patient sh- yeah like yeah. before you can see them <laughs> yeah. so okay. how, how do people make right, yeah. Yeah, like having a, a good personal referral is a really nice way to go because, yeah, there is a commitment to your care and it takes time. You don't go to the gym just once and you're fit for life mm. um, and you certainly don't eat it, uh, one of Joe's quirky <laughs> cooking recipes and all of a sudden you've done the GAPS program. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, there is a commitment to getting yeah. yourself well. You know, So if you've got to a point where you're now symptomatic, then you've gone a long way beyond um, where the body would normally feel at ease. And so you're now in a state of what's called disease, or mm. you know, and you stay in that state of disease, then you move to disease, you know. And so there's there's challenges there that people don't yet fully understand that it takes time to heal the body. It takes time to train the nervous system to work really, really well again. Um, and it wants to do it, but you've got to allow it to get to that point. It's like the gut wants to heal, but you've got to give it time. Mm. And the body wants to lose weight but you've got to give it time. You don't just have a salad and fish for one meal and lose 20 kilos. Mm-hmm. Like That's just not how it's going to happen. So it does actually take some time. And because people are so conditioned to take paracetamol uh, when they've mm-hmm. got pain, they expect that one treatment or one visit to the chiropractor is going to actually fix it. it. Yeah. Well, yeah, but the, it's you've got to actually get the spine and the nervous system and the musculature. All of that's got to work really well again, and it just takes time. Um, and what we do know is that the intensive part of care in the early phase of your care is very, very powerful. So a lot of a lot of your benefit and a lot of your results come from that early part of care, um, and then the long term benefit of chiropractic happens over time. So it's months and years of care, not just a couple of days or weeks. Mm. So it's um, you, you want to do it for a longer period of time. Absolutely. But, you know, to, to put that concern at ease, um, it's good to look for a chiropractor that's part of um, a, a group of people that are moving in the same direction. And so I always recommend that people look for chiropractors that are part of what's a group called the CAA, the Chiropractors Association of Australia. So that'll always be up. That that means that most of the time those chiropractors have a particular philosophy that the body um, is able to heal itself and uh, and they will look outside of just pain um, to, to help the body go really well. So they'll, yes, they'll look for pain and they'll, they'll identify it and try to manage it and help you and treat it, et cetera, et cetera but they allow the body to heal itself as well. So there's a, an understanding that the body is really powerful and can actually heal itself. So um, I'll look for those people. And I also look for a practice that looks after children. Mm. So if you've got a practice that looks after children as well as looks after adults, then you've got a really great practice. Um, if you've got a practice that's primarily focused on um, back pain, 
then that's a great place to go for back pain. But it may not be the place to go for someone to take charge and to assist you in um, healing other areas of your life as well. Mm. Excellent. That's, that's really helpful. Maybe after, after this I can pick your brain about if you know anyone local to me anyway as well to get your referral. Um, yeah. My, yeah, sure. my chiropractor was partly trained by Damien way up here in Final yeah. Yep, no in way. New Zealand. Oh. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who's your chiropractor? Tim. Uh, 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 what's his last name? He's just Tim. <laughs> I think it's Tim Jack. Oh, Timothy Jack. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. know oh, Tim. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's so he cool. He always speaks yeah. so well of you. <laughs> oh, I paid him well. What's really nice? <laughs> is, um, there's this really beautiful thing, and I think part of what I um, what I use as my philosophy is you never know how far reaching oh, uh, what you say, idea. what you do, or what you do, or, you, or, you, or what you don't do, yeah. or what you don't say actually goes. So you don't know the impact of your message and how far reaching that is. And I suppose you guys would both be aware of that now that you're yeah, world famous with your books and your podcasts. It's uh, you know the people coming up to you is and hearing those stories, Joe. That's great. So hi to Tim for me. I will. I will. He'll be thrilled to hear his name on the podcast. He listens. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, then good. we'll get maybe to the to the and uh, that topic that we skipped over in the beginning. Yes, we need to get and, to that. And, uh, the main topic of is, the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not, no, it's what not we good. wanted to do here was to, to bring clarity again and, and a balanced view because, um, you know, people, they, they're either on the left or the right of this issue. And I'd, I'd like to get a middle ground for it and to see really what's going on and to not have any preconceived judgment or anything like that. And just to really see it with clarity. And as I said before, uh, earlier in the show, I, I was overseas and I came back and I had a bunch of emails people saying that natural health therapies are under attack and that we have to sign petitions and that things aren't, uh, you know, our access to natural health therapies is going to be, uh, we won't, we would lose it. And then um, we were, I was, I was seeing it on the Facebook uh, post, all my friends were putting it up on Facebook. I'm like, what's mm, going on? Like, I leave the country for, for for a month and I come back. And, and it all falls know, apart without all, you for a while. Uh, yeah, what's happening? <laughs> Don't so, leave uh, again. Don't leave again. So, uh, so I thought uh, you'd be the best person to give us that kind of clarity. So can you tell us a bit about what's going on? Yeah, look, it came to light um, a few months ago. Uh, I'm a member of – I'm not a member. Well, I suppose I am a supporter of the Health Australia Party, um, which is a, a political party that's run by Isaac Golden, mm -hmm. who was started by Isaac, and he's a homeopath, and he's very, very um, – incredibly clever and re and so smart and he advises the Indian government on the immunization programs and uh, and has done so for many many years and his um, his model of healthcare uh, is homeopathy uh, which is very much linked to herbalism and naturopathy and nutrition and all those sorts of things and and so he's been standing up for the rights of uh, those sorts of practitioners in Australia um, and trying to say trying to um, ensure that um, that the public get access to these sorts of um, therapies and treatments, um, and, and fairly and easily without bias and um, uh, I suppose um, vindication. So the Health Australia Party, I think, was you know set up you know just at the nick of time, just before the last um, election, and didn't really rise to power and didn't really get enough vote. However, Isaac contacted me and said, "Hey, we're in a bit of trouble. We're about to lose naturopathy, and uh, we're about to lo not lose, but lose um, the right to claim uh, from you know, the services through health insurance." And I always thought that health insurance was a, a, like a private thing, so it was something that um, was owned by private enterprise yeah. um, and uh, they could determine who was on their policy and who wasn't on their policy, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, and what cover, things they covered. But it appears um, that that's not the case, that the government has a role to play in health insurance mm. um, that I didn't know about. I, obviously, I knew that there was the Medicare component, but there's a there's a government component to um, health private insurance. Health and so, insurance. yeah, and they've legislated or they've now – put into place legislation that means that um, naturopaths, yoga, um, acupuncture, I don't, actually I don't know if acupuncture is part of it because acupuncture is a registered health profession. So um, th there's a, a number of different therapies that were part of this particular um, legislation that now can't be claimed in 
um, your private health insurance because the government said so. But what the government mentioned to us probably 10 or so years ago, about a decade ago, was that we needed to get our, our shops in order. We needed to collate evidence that what we were doing was safe, number one, effective, number two, um, cost effective, um, probably number three or four, um, and highly utilised. And what ended up happening is instead of the associations coming together, and there's a number of associations, five, six or seven of them, um, instead of each of those associations coming together and, and, and forming an umbrella group or becoming registered as part of the national board, um, they continued to be independent. Um, and the challenge with remaining independent was that you had lots of people moving in different directions and they weren't bound by a code of ethics or a standard of governance. And that also meant that there was not much money put into research. Um, and so a lot of money has been spent on product development and the advancement of the safety of the care, but very little evidence uh, was was taken from the practice of it. And and it's, it's not necessarily under um, – strict control as to the way in which people would actually practice. So if you, if Joe, if you came to me with a particular problem and Fuad came to me with the same problem um, and it had the same cause, um, so you went to two different naturopaths, you went to mm-hmm. two different naturopaths, same problem, same cause, same symptoms, people would treat or manage it in two very, very different ways yeah. um, based on the education that had been provided by industry. Mm-hmm. And that's not very, very safe for the government and the government doesn't see it as very reproducible and right, potentially yeah. it's very, very expensive and to some extent quite risky because one person might get it right and the other person might not get it right mm. and uh, so on and so forth. So essentially we were told a long time ago that we need to get our shops in order and we didn't. And um, and now we're in a situation where the government said, well, guys, you've been told for a long time that you need to get this sorted out, and you haven't. Um, and we could definitely argue, and I would argue this, that government funding, especially through the NHMRC, National Health and Research Medical Council, has been directed towards drugs and surgery and mainstream medicine. Mm-hmm. That money hasn't come into natural medicine to you know see if it's it worked or not. They, they did a flawed um, investigation into the results and the benefits of homeopathy. That was very flawed, and that's, you know, before the courts at the moment, so they can't be spoken about at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of political, medica- uh, uh, political medicine that has kind of seemed to be tainting um, natu- naturopathy and other health uh, professions that are outside of mainstream medicine. And, uh, and that makes us look bad. Um, and so we just we didn't sit together and we didn't get everything in order. So the government said, well, we can't fund you. And mm-hmm. that's essentially what it's come down to. So now is a really important time that, um, that the professions have to get together, somehow pull together and then state their case and say, hang on a second, we've now got our stuff into order. And it might take two, three, five or ten years to get back on the radar. But um, we need the public support. We need the public's help. Uh, we need the government to know that the public likes us and, and yeah. wants to use us. And has found and, you beneficial. Uh, and, and has found yeah. us beneficial and, be, and we're safe and we're effective. Um, and and then we've got to get our stuff into order and then get some research under our belts um, that, you know, are beyond rat and mouse trials. We need human mm. studies. And, and so we've, got to, we've just got to lift our gun. Right. There's nothing like a crisis to bring people together, Damien. Yeah, <laughs> so that's true. right. That's right. Um, and look, guys, so, I'm so middle of the bell curve. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm definitely not an extremist. I wrote an article. I'm not a health activist, but I need you to know this, and I put that on my Facebook page. Yeah. I think it's been shared 60 times, and oh, lots of people have read it. There's been lots of comments. It's been really good. Um, I actually got a bit of help there from Kyle Brock. He wrote a really awesome. great article, and I, I literally cut and pasted some of his paragraphs into my one just to yeah. to make mm-hmm. it sound. Well, I noticed um, his newsletter on, on the subject was good. That's all I've read so far. Yeah, well, when you read his newsletter and my article, you see that some parts are very similar, Joe. <laughs> uh, but, I'll have uh, to, we I, can put the links, uh, we can put the link in the show notes for you all who are listening. Yeah, that would be cool. That would be cool. But, um, but then what What do we do? Like, do, is there something that we can do? Like, is yeah. something those petitions going to do anything? Like, what do we yeah. do? Yeah. Well, certainly I know that Isaac's thing with the Health Australia Party's thing was to get enough signatures that would um, help sway the government into reconsidering what they're doing. Um, I think that, you know, contacting your local member of parliament and parliament and saying, hey, I use naturopathy and I don't like that it's been taken away from me. Mm. Um, and then sitting with your parliamentarian, actually booking a time or writing a letter to your local politician. Um, and, you know, in Australia, we don't fight back. 
mm. ever. And you yeah. would see this for our, I'm, I'm sure that in other countries around the world and all of us when we've observed governments taking over countries, mm. um, there's a big public outcry if something's yeah. not right. Yeah. yeah. We don't yeah. do it in Australia. We go, oh, okay, Slap. well, you know. She'll be right, mate. You, we, yeah, we voted <laughs> no, you in. You'll do it I right. I think also, also one of my biggest concerns is it's easier to keep something on than to reintroduce it after it's been taken off. Like you look at something oh, yeah. like Ephedra, which was like a, a plant yeah. that uh, naturopaths had been using for the centuries, really, and yeah. then that got uh, scheduled. And there's no way yeah. we're going to be able to bring that back easily anymore. Like it's just not going to happen. And, well, they did the uh, same thing with Carver, mate. So they did the same yeah. thing with Carver. They did the same That's, thing with um, oh, what's the um, there's a big a big leaf. Oh, what's that leaf called? It's known as bone set. Oh anyway, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, the one that they uh, said that's going to kill you if you have too much of it. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, anyway, they've they've managed to bring those back on, but again, that's all about research. And so, as long as you can prove that something's safe, and in Australia we have incredible legislation regulation around vitamins and minerals. We've got the, the strictest standards in the world, and so provided you can show evidence for cause and effect, um, then we can be used. But so it's not that we're going to lose access to this stuff. It's that we're not able to re- get government assistance to utilize the. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it, we already have the government access now. Let's just yeah. keep it rather than. <laughs> yeah, I know. This, you know, I know. I mean? Wouldn't it be great? I know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very di- – you're right. I agree with you. It's so difficult to bring it back in. And we worked so hard, you know, to get back it in, in 1994, place. I think it was, yeah, 94, 95, 96 – David Fitz, who was then the the head of the umbrella group that kind of looked after all of natural therapies, which I think has been disbanded now, um, that David managed to meet with the regulators and meet with the governments and then got us into private health insurance. And so mm. that was something that he fought for back then, you know, 23 odd years ago, 24 years ago. And uh, and it's it didn't last long. But basically what that says is that in that time, we've done nothing really to prove that what we do do work. Mm -hmm. Um, All we've done is just continue to do our thing, continue to do our thing, continue to do our thing. And then um, with further advancements and further um, shifts in the goalposts of what our requirements should be and our reporting should be, um, it just hasn't been met. Mm. It's a worry. Wow. but, you know, this is uh, this has been a general kind of podcast with you and um, we probably be very well served if we brought you back on the show to talk about a bit more specific topics, things like um, the, the topics that our uh, listeners are really interested in, things like reversing autoimmune diseases and allergies mm. and things like that, mm. and how we Feeling approach that and... from your perspective. Oh, I'd love and, to help you. I'd love to come back and talk about that. Yeah. Well, if you'd have it, mate. Oh, yeah. thank you. We would love it. <laughs> I've always said to yes. you, Damien, that you need to start a, in your spare time Sorry. a YouTube channel for kids with um, explaining health because you're so good at explaining it mm-hmm. in a fun way. Like when you go – when you hit – isn't that right, Fouad, when you hear Damien speak like at the Wellness Summit? It's just so, so well done and everyone can oh, understand yeah, it. It's just like um, really clear, Very Damien. clear. Like you're really, really and clear fun. about your message. Like we were and, pretty serious uh, today, but <laughs> <laughs> in real life, Damien's <laughs> such a serious. cracker. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. I'm pretty lighthearted. I'm a pretty lighthearted kind of guy. Yeah. But I do want to, you know, I try to make it easy for people to understand, but I think philosophy is what makes things easy because if you can yeah. embrace a philosophy around health and life. You've got to know the why. Then it's, yeah, you've got to know your why. Start with why. And, um, mm. and But the moment you start to talk about rhetoric and you start to bring in complicated, you know, words and complicated mm. um, approaches to getting the body well, is I suppose the moment you start to ignore the wisdom of the body and, and really coming back to that philosophy that the body here heals the body, oh, sorry, the power that made the body heals the body. Um, if, if you can maintain that philosophy, then really what you're doing is anything that helps the body heal. That's really what you're looking to do. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Damon, thank you so much. And yeah. uh, we'll certainly have you on in 2018 as that's coming up sooner than we think. Sure. It is, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Thanks so much. Well. Thanks, Jojo. It's great Thanks to be so uh, talking with you guys. Yeah, and we'll be down in Melbourne um, start of December. So hopefully we can see you Let's at one of up. our seminars. Let's catch up. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> That'd, be good. That'd be great. Let's have a, uh, a soy, oh, half strength vegan almond. No, <laughs> stop. Skinny, <laughs> half strength, whatever we're going to do. <laughs> 
Let's just go out for dinner and have a good meal. <laughs> Sounds <Yeah>. good to me. <laughs> Meat and some vegetables, that would be good. Oh, I love it. See, this is where health's coming back to, sensibleness. Yeah. I think that's where we're going to be. Yeah, right, Damo, chat to you soon. Thank you, Damo. See you guys. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst The Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of The Wellness Couch podcasts.